So it is Monday the 13th of May 2019 and Professor Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall Centre has kindly agreed to a discussion about all things climate. Um, <laughs> could be a long discussion. It could be a long discussion. It's been a couple of years. It was just after Paris. To, when you come back from Paris, 2016, yeah. uh, that, we, that we last had this chat. So, yes, yeah. uh, well, well, a huge amount has happened since then. A, a, a few more uh, <laughs> parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere and, uh, a, and even more methane. Yeah. And emissions are going up. Yeah. Let's start with the international. Um, let's start with the IPCC's 1.5 degree report, which is, of course, an outgrowth of the Paris Agreement. A couple of questions. Um, the obvious one, what's missing from it? What's wrong with it? Well... I should really be honest here and say that I wasn't in favour of the IPCC doing a 1.5 degree C report because I didn't think it's possible to achieve. Um, and I've reflected since the report came out and um, I'm pleased now that they did go ahead with one. I don't agree with everything that's in there. Um, and the reason I, I'm pleased that they've had the report and actually the reason I'm also pleased that 1.5 was included in Paris, even though at the time I was thinking, why have we got 1.5 in here, is that but just prior to Paris, or in fact two or three years prior to Paris, I kept hearing an increasing number of voices within the academic realm, who again, away from the microphone, um, were saying, well, we haven't got any hope for two degrees centigrade, we're going to be really aiming towards three and four, and that's much more realistic. And that, that was coming out of a, a lot of academics deeply involved in issues of climate change. And then the Paris Agreement said 1.5, and to some extent, even though I, I don't, didn't think at the time it was viable, and still probably still holds that view, I think what it did is it, it dragged that argument that was starting to move away from two and up towards three and four back down towards two and even they're touching a bit more on one and a half. So I think it was an important almost counter narrative to the views of a lot of people within science who I don't think were making a scientific judgment on whether two degrees C was possible. They were making their political judgments on whether it was possible or not. And to be honest, you know, they have no more um, qualifications to, to make those political judgments than any other citizen. You know, they're scientists who are interested in the subject, but they don't have any particular expertise in that. Mm. So I was concerned that it would be moving in a certain direction. So the 1.5 re request in the Paris Agreement and then the 1.5 report, I think, did help um, cement us to, to making more stringent action in line with these lower temperatures. Or were, promises of stringent st action. Promises of stringent action, <laughs> yes. And, and not as stringent as it needs to be to deliver on those temperatures either. Um, but there was another important part, I think, of the 1.5 report, and to me probably the most important part of it, was that it started to try to um, differentiate the, the different set of impacts you might get for quite a small temperature change. Mm. So for most people, you think, well, 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade, particularly if you're you know, living in Manchester, you think, well, half a degree, so what? But when you start to get some handle of what the difference in the impacts might look like, you start to realise how important these temperatures are. And I think the 1.5 report was actually quite good in that, in starting to show there are big differences between 1.5 and 2, which, give, which allows people to think, well, of course, there are big differences between 2 and 3 and 3 and 4, so you know, we do have to do something about climate change. So the impact part, I think, was really very important. The mitigation part, I think, was, as is the, usually the case in the IPC, was appalling. Um, and I think that's typically, typically the case, with, in my view, with Working Group 3 of the IPCC that focus on mitigation. That's not to say that some of the new chairs with um, Jim Ski in particular, Diana Vorsatz, uh, I think these, these people are, are going to be asking new questions of mitigation that previous incumbents haven't asked. They've been very happy with the great big integrated assessment modelling exercises that show that um, we can solve it all with technology, ideally technology in the future at very, very low cost. So BECS, for example. BECS, negative emissions, large levels of forestry, anything that broadly maintains the economic status quo. And I think um, particularly uh, Diana Vorsatz are, are, are much more uh, open to questioning that and saying, well, what other ways are there to try and address these issues on the issues of demand, on the social side, the cultural side, as well as the technical. Um, so I think they, they have a much healthier perspective on, on this. Nevertheless, I personally think mitigation is innately a political issue we, mm. and, it, and it cannot be removed from that and therefore I don't really want to see it within the IPCC but and most other people don't take that view but that's been my position for quite a long time I, I don't think mitigation should be in the IPCC um, I think the science is as near as you can ever get it's, it's, it's the nearest thing that humans can do to something that's neutral we are humans so we are inevitably influenced by things around us um, and by funding but nevertheless I think science is, is, is the 
is the core element of the IPCC that does need to be continually improved. Well, I mean, the IPCC, um, digression here, you know, it's a 30-year-old institution that was fit for purpose, maybe you would argue, in 1988 when it was founded up till, I don't know, 95 in the second assessment report. Are you, are you arguing that... No, I'm pleased. I'm still pleased that the IPCC do what the IPCC do, but I don't, don't particularly like the mitigation aspect. I mean, okay. I think looking at the both the uh, the science and the impacts, and to some extent the adaptation, but again, that becomes very political. Mm. But this, and, and obviously, all of these have a political element, but I think mitigation more than anything else is is, is political. So strongly and deeply political that it's it's not an appropriate place to have. It's a consensual view of what we need to do about climate change. Um, but I think the other the other elements, most of the other elements, certainly the impacts on the, on, the, on the science, I think that they are still important and need to be developed. Um, and particularly, I mean, although in many respects we've known all the science we needed to know to act, I think the impacts is an area where, uh, particularly when you try to break it down to, to geographical areas, where we have lots of improvement to make to yes. help us understand how to deal with climate change. So I think the impact is lots and lots of science to be done there, lots of understanding, and, and to some extent that feeds into the, into the adaptation agenda, but that is innately, again, more political. Okay. Um, were you surprised at the, the traction that the 1.5 degree report got? Because my assumption was that it was just going to be a one-day wonder and sink without trace, but it, that's not what happened. I mean, I know several people mm. here in Manchester who will watch this video who are not climate scientists at all, who read the whole damn thing, and it freaked them out, and it is still freaking them out. So, mm. I, I, were you surprised? Perhaps a little. Um, I'm never. T I mean, perhaps I'm not so easily surprised by these things. I just don't know quite how they're going to go. Mm. I, I, I do. <laughs> perhaps it's a it's a cop out in some respects. But I see the world as a much more emergent place, and sometimes things happen, and sometimes things don't. Yeah. And we love to find some causal reasons, though. It's because of this. It's normally because a whole suite of things, yes. some of which we can identify, probably 90% of which we can't. Um, and so sometimes these ha things yeah. happen. And you know, a, a few other changes around it, and perhaps it wouldn't have been such a big issue. If, if some other big issue had come in the news that yeah. week, then no doubt it would, have, it, would, it would have been off the agenda. Or the hot summer last year, yeah. or Greta Thunberg. Yeah, I mean, there's, we'll a, there's a whole suite of these whole things. Whole suite of things. Yeah, there's no single together. course. No, there's actually. any single no, course, no. no. But, and, but I think the report has been an important part of a, uh, an opening up a new agenda now. So, but it's one facet of that. Yeah. Um, moving on to the UNFCCC, uh, what's the point? <laughs> They've been, you know, we're up to COP25 now, yeah. and you've had all the subsidiary meetings in between and all the special meetings. I don't know that anyone's ever calculated the carbon footprint of the UNFCCC, and it all would be that absolutely in huge. Um, I suppose it's a little bit like my view of the, of the IPCC, and I have to must, my understanding that the UNFCCC is much less developed than that is of the IPCC. But, but you have been going to the European ones of late. I, I have. I've been to. I've never been to now. I've only, I've only been to a few. I've been to the the Paris one, the, the Warsaw, Paris, Bonn, Copenhagen, and no, I didn't get no, there. Okay, no. Fine. I was going to, but then there was all the huge queues and everything, so I was not actually travelling there, and I hadn't even got to the ferry terminal, and I turned around and came back. Yeah. Um, so I've only been to a handful of them. Okay. Um, well, if, those events I think are, are profligate in, from a carbon perspective, and I don't think necessarily are helping the agenda. And they certainly don't, they're not symbolically, I think they're really problematic. I think they could be significantly improved if they had, and this is my point I repeatedly make about all sorts of things about climate change, if they had demonstrated that they believed in their own research findings and, and, and the issues that were at hand. And, and by that, I don't just mean buying some cheap offset somewhere else in the world to allow you know, people to business fly all the way to, to one of these events and chat about climate change. Um, I actually mean that you know, make a real effort to make these very low carbon events in a very visual way. So, so other people lots of video seat. conferencing. Lots of video conferencing, yeah, and journalists only there to talk to people um, you know, who, who had travelled by, by some low carbon means mm. to get there or, or you know, virtually. Yeah. So you, you make the whole thing mm. focused on not only are we going to talk about climate change, we're going to demonstrate it in action. Mm. And it has never done this. It's been mm. absolutely appalling. And the one I went to in Bonn was, was, was shameful. And it claimed to be zero carbon. You know, next door to a, an expanding brown coal mine, um, all the screens on, as I pointed out in various yeah. tweets at the time, all the screens on at night. Um, it was a huge air conditioned and heated combined at the same time, uh, tents, and the whole thing was apparently zero carbon. It's, it's just a scam. 
that doesn't help because there's some really important things going on at these events. So I'm not opposed to the UNFCCC, but I think you could you could probably reduce the UNFCCC's carbon footprint by about 95 percent and still deliver the good things that it does do. Mm. Um, but I think it's been shooting itself in the foot for quite a long time as well. Yes. Uh, and, and in that sense, perhaps the leadership should have demonstrated much more. Mm. And I think the leadership, and this is not my area, but it's the, at the last COP in Katowice last year, I engaged quite a lot with some of the civil society groups who I don't normally engage with other than giving talks. Um, and some other academics that were there as well, and particularly early career academics. And there was a very strong sense that the UNFCCC is trying to um, stage manage everything. Yes. And that I found really quite disturbing, and perhaps I've been incredibly naive, because this had been going on for years. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you start to realise the processes that were ongoing. And I discussed that in a blog that I wrote post Kadavici yeah. about, this was quite a shock to me actually, yeah. this level of sort of big brother, or perhaps more appropriately, a big sister. Um, overseeing of these events, um, which was which was stopping discussion and dialogue um, about things that didn't fit neatly with the status quo. And if the NGOs step too far out of line, they get their um, attendance yeah. privileges revoked. Yeah, get their badges removed. They get debadged. De apparently, yes. is the expression that these people yes. use, and it's something they they regularly have been using that expression. Um, and of course, last year we also had people who demonstrated as I understood quite legally in, in, in Belgium um, and then were stopped going into Katowice, mm. got into Poland. You thought, yes. well hang on, this is another European Union country yeah. and you're being stopped movement around the European Union. There were some other things that going on there I think which were quite disturbing. Well um, I mean, but within the country as well, before the Paris COP there were preemptive arrests of named yeah. activists yes. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I do think all of that needs to be opened up, and partly concern for that is that not only does, does it, you know, it, it infringe some of my concerns as a citizen, and people may take different views on that, but actually I think it, um, it uh, undermines the diversity of the debate, yeah. and therefore it takes away some of the solutions and options and responses we may want to consider. So we end up with the same set of technocratic approaches, yeah. approaches. Yeah. Yeah. which we spent 30 years failing with. Yeah. So, so we need new voices, and uh, one new voice is a now 16-year-old Swedish schoolgirl. Yeah. I won't ask you if you're surprised, you know, how that's taken off, because as you say, emergent properties. Yeah. Are you, do you worry at all that she's being not... That, that parts of her message are being selectively ignored and other parts which are more acceptable to the avazas and to the green capitalists of this world are being amplified? Um... Does it? Yeah, that's inevitable. I mean, I, do, I wouldn't expect anything else, and I, thought mm. I, could, I would be genuinely shocked if we got anything else. Of course, that's what people will use. They'll use the bits of the message they want to hear, and they'll ignore the rest. Mm. Um, perhaps slightly flippantly, it doesn't worry me too much, because I think she's much brighter than they are, um, and probably has much more staying power. So, I, I think, think they're underestimating her. I, I think they're mm. underestimating her, but what I also, so, you, know, you may notice, I'm, I've been quite involved with, to some extent, with her and her family. And trying, not in, they came to us later on when I was working in Sweden, asking about some. Just you know, she comes and asks me questions, science mm. questions. That's all. So I don't, it's like working with a colleague here. So the interview I gave with Spiegel a little while ago was making that point exactly. They said, "Am I writing the speeches? I have nothing to do with writing the speeches. Yeah. I mean, she writes the speeches, not her parents, no one else. Mm. She writes them, but she then asks some perfectly reasonable scientific questions mm. um, from a from a really quite a solid position of knowledge and understanding. So they are like they're you know they're debates between colleagues is, that's yeah. how I see it with her. Um, so she is she's strong and she's knowledgeable. And she obviously is a remarkably good communicator in a way that people had not expected. Mm. And well, they think Asperger's it. means unable to understand emotions, which I don't think it does. I think you've ever watched her like, I love watching her sometimes when she's filmed. And you get little smiles, which yes. has these little bits of humour, and they are very, very funny. They're, th they're things that are just though. going on. And sometimes uh, I feel nice for her dad because she's, she makes little comments, and he says something, and she slightly disagrees. And, and her, her, her father's a lovely man. He's really good at sort of making sure that she's that she's got her feet on the ground, mm. I think, and that she's not not been pushed too far. Which would be very challenging to do, I would have thought, given the position she's in. But I love that sort of interplay. Sometimes you see that between the two of them. Um, but of course, my, my concern had been that we put too much pressure on her and that actually, you know, Greta Thunberg is going to resolve these issues. And mm. she puts out, it's not, the, it's not her role at all. She's a catalyst. She's an informed and robust 
catalyst for change, but the change doesn't come from her. The change just comes from, from us all collectively making our contribution. Mm. Um, but I think she's a difficult voice to ignore. Mm. And she cuts through the fluff and the nonsense in a way that we've needed for a long time. And mm. the academic, it was really, I think, in some respects, the, the role and responsibility of the academics to do this. And we haven't, we've fundamentally failed. We're, at a collective level, I think we've been pretty much co-opted. Um, certainly in terms of mitigation, perhaps less so in terms of the science. Though we won't get into this now, but I do think perhaps there were some early signs of the science being slightly co-opted mm. in, in, um, in the 1.5 report, but that's a, perhaps an issue for another day, because yeah. we need to investigate that a little bit more. Um, but on mitigation, I think we pretty much we were co-opted about 20 years ago, mm. and particularly the senior, more established figures in the mitigation realm. There was an, to, to be fair, there was an enormous amount of pressure exerted on the IPCC in the mid-90s onwards. I mean, the Global Climate Coalition and the other forces mm. were really gunning for sort of individual scientists. Well, Michael Mann in his early days, what mm. Michael Mann calls the Serengeti strategy, strategy, you know, pick on some scientists who you perceive to be weak and beat them up. Yeah. And then hope that that sends a message to everyone else to self-censor. Yeah. I mean, it was our job then to come to each other's support in the sense, on the basis of the, of the arguments. Mm. Um, and we haven't done this. Uh, and I think it's, it's to our deep shame. Mm. And it continues today. And it's primarily driven by, as far as I can tell, by um, more senior established figures who put pressure on earlier career researchers to take particular, particular perspectives. And again, I heard this repeatedly at, um, at COP, that early career researchers were... Were, were, some of them were quite seriously chastised for asking difficult questions in some of the side events. Now, this is it's not outrageous. Uh, it, it is outrageous, and I thought this just happened here and there. I then spoke to more and more of them. The more I spoke with, the more I realised that this this approach was was widespread. I mean, I just you know, not only the NGOs were being were being um, sort of not co-opted necessarily here, but the NGOs were being silenced to some extent. But so were quite a lot of the early career researchers who come to this with a different set of baggage to the rest of us, new new sets of insights, different ways of viewing the world, different sort of world views and paradigms to some extent, and we need those, we need to hear these voices of different ways of thinking about these issues, but they were being stifled by the old guard, and, I, and that still goes on, The amount, and you hear that, I mean I've heard that in Sweden, which you'd think is a more open country, where supervisors have, uh, senior supervisors, particularly when they're well known, have um, you know, actively stopped some of their researchers from engaging. Um, because it would be socially board. awkward for them. Yeah, yeah, and do not disagree with your supervisors. No. Um, and this all feeds into, probably feeds into, at least in my impression, a sort of a competitive model. We're mm. all fighting for certain you know, pennies of, or crumbs of funding for, for our research. Mm. Um, despite what the sceptics might tell the rest of the world, that we're all washed, awash with money and... Driving so, Bentleys yeah, and I mean, yeah, lighting yeah. cigars with 50 yeah. pound notes. <laughs> if only. If, 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 if you come out and wonder about some of our officers here and have to shoehorn people in. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not like that. We are fighting for pennies, and um, and and that actually makes people scrap in a way that's really unhelpful and not how academics should be behaving. You mentioned in our discussion about Greta Thunberg, you know, that she's not doing it alone, and that it's, there's collective responsibility. So I suppose now turning, segueing between the international and the national, Extinction Rebellion, which mm. wants to be international, but as far as I can tell, is is mostly still a UK phenomenon when you saw those sort of occupations of the bridge in um, London and Parliament Square and Marble Arch and the, the pink boat named after the murdered Ecuadorian uh, environmental activist what what went through your mind well, to be honest part of that I was away on a cycling trip in continental Europe so I missed quite a bit of it but I did keep up with it as best we could um, on our phones and so forth to just try to you know, check the news um, I mean, initially, I was pleased people are, have, uh, are raising these issues, I and mean, I was particularly pleased that it was done in a, in, in a remarkably peaceful way. And I think that is so important here. And okay, we can argue they were causing lots of problems with people, but then climate change is all about problems. Yeah. And you know, the problems they were causing are much less than the problems our emissions are causing for people living in Bangladesh and elsewhere. Um, but I was, I was heartened by the fact there seemed to be a wide constituency of people, so it wasn't just the usual suspects. Mm. Um, that they were peacefully engaged, that they seemed pretty 
astute in terms of things like communication and so forth, even though I don't think they, were, they had a really clear view of the science or a clear view of exactly what they were asking for. But I think that did start to emerge a little bit as they developed. Um, and I probably was pleased to see this going on, but thought it wouldn't, it wouldn't continue. And it has continued on much longer than I expected. And I have engaged a little bit with some people now in Extinction Rebellion. Um, and I'm really pleased that there's another set of voices. And in fact, it's not just, and they're not, they're not controlled in any particular way either. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a, it is quite a diversity of voices that we're hearing. So the, you know, the more people that are engaged in this, in many respects, the better. It's how to, how to then coalesce this to make something that, that does drive a, a political change. But the policy makers, if you look at people like Michael Gove, um, you know, he has now uh, engaged with people from Extinction Rebellion and listened to some of their voices, which I think has been interesting because it's not as if it, that's been in isolation. If that had just occurred without the 1.5 report and without probably people like Thunberg trying to drive that agenda, then I think it would have been, it may well have died in the vine much earlier mm. than it, well, it's still, still thriving now. Let's that wasn't a pun thrive. on his wife's surname, was it? Yeah, that no, was just no. <laughs> So let's hope that, uh, that you know, this, this coming together of a series of things, plus I think people are witnessing it's often what is, but also even sometimes it's what they perceive to be climate change. Yeah. Um, and th th along with that, we are seeing other things like the, the recent report on biodiversity, the, the, the discussion about insects. Um, and again, all of these are not in, in and of themselves climate change events or unless they're driven by climate change, but they are indicative of, of, of the sorts of treatment that we have given or disregard we have had for ecosystems and for the natural world within which we, as part of that world, operate. And I think that there's some sort of recognition of that. Um, well, the name, together. Extinction, I mean, it's, it's trying, I think it's trying to combine the climate and the biodiversity yeah. angles rather than just sort of carbon rebellion. Rebellion, yes, yeah. You know. yeah, that's true. But then if you look at the, I think the 1.5 report is interesting how it did that. I mean, the, the issue about the impacts there um, is not just, it's not just about climate change. That's you know, yeah. That's, it's it's this amongst the whole suite of other pressures that we're putting on the system. And I still think probably in terms of the oceans, we're not really focusing sufficiently on that yet. And that's probably again because we don't fully understand them. So there's probably a lot more science to be done there. But we do understand quite a lot about them. Um, and we we use them repeatedly as a dump. Mm. Um, you know, whether that's everything from fishing, where I mean, if we if we imagine going into the wilderness, wherever the wilderness may exist, and just you know just dragging huge metal chains across it, which is what we do when we dredge, yes. or when we go fishing for scallops, or whatever it might be. So I think that there, there are things we do with the oceans we would never dream of doing with what we visually see on land. Mm. Um, and again, the oceans are, are part of an ecosystem, part of our global ecosystem, and I think we've treated them with disregard. So I think that's a whole area yet to be um, sort of explored and come to the fore in terms of our concern. I mean, the Blue Planet did that to some extent with plastics, but I still don't think we're really thinking sufficiently about the change in species in the oceans as we get increased acidification, all the pollutants, how can the last percentage of the world population rely on the protein from...